We are going to talk about excuse me, teamwork. Which you guys may be able to provide some input on now that you've done some group work. So we'll see. So what's a team? What's a team to you guys? How do you define a team? Group of people working together. Group of people working together. All right. Agreeing. Yeah. All right. Compromising. Compromising. Yeah, open minded. Anybody else have a definition? Team? A team is a group of people working together to achieve a common goal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All, All right. right. So she went textbook. <laughs> went textbook. <laughs> All right. Anybody else? Is a family a team? Yeah. What what makes them a team? <laughs> what makes a family a team? Because we have one leader, which would be me, the mother. <laughs> we have the team. The so you're the leader. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So so a team is defined by a leader, yeah. a group of people that has a leader. Is that it sounds yeah. like that's your definition of a team? Mm -hmm. I think a team has a leader because they have someone to to be able to delegate, delegate and look up to. And okay, that leader has to be a, leading by a good example. You know? Okay. All right, so as uh, Kamaya mentioned, um, the book defines a team as a group of people with complementary skills. Nobody said this. So complementary skills, which is important, and we'll get into that a little bit later, who are committed to a common approach for which they hold themselves mutually accountable, working together to achieve a common goal. So another take home is that a team should have a common goal in mind. There's different types of teams. We may have our short-term teams. We may have long-term teams. Um, there's different types of teams. So we have our cross-functional teams, our virtual teams. These are teams that, for my online classes, they're virtual teams. They work virtually together. Task forces and committees, these are all different types of teams. So as you guys know by now, there's tons of challenges with working with teams, right? Um, well, this doesn't stop once you finish here. There's many challenges in working with teams when you get out and you're working. Um, the, the big challenge is that there's not a whole lot of preparation for this. This is why I try to do my duty to help prepare you guys because without me requiring teamwork, there's no teamwork class. You don't take a class to learn how to work in teams. So if we don't try to encourage you guys to work in teams, you won't know until you get there um, out into the workforce. But as we all know, especially in healthcare, you're going to be working with other people in teams. It's inevitable. Um, now some conflicts happen um, amongst physicians and nurses that work together in teams. Why? Why do you think conflicts arise between doctors and nurses working in teams? Different opinions among teams. Different opinions. <coughs> different styles of how they do things. Different styles. Mm -hmm. So this is a good point. Um, you have, you know, a physician who may be used to having a certain leadership style where what they say goes and but if they're working on a team with nurses and other people, that may, they may not be able to apply that same leadership style, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a good point. Um, and, and so both of the things that your classmates have mentioned are good points. Um, these are some of the reasons why conflicts arise in teams, particularly with physicians and nurses. You have to also keep in mind that they've come from different schools of thought. They've had different types of training. Um, in school, so they are going to have different mindsets and different opinions, right? Um, so, what are some of the benefits of an effective team? Well, with an effective team, we can improve the quality of care with our patients, which it should be our ultimate goal, right? To improve patient care. We can be more efficient, which is always good. We can improve or increase the job satisfaction with our employees as well as our patients, right? 
And if we're working more efficiently, hopefully we're also being more productive, which could potentially save us money or make us more money, right? Um, now, when we think in terms of higher level managers, when they think about effective teams, here are the things they see happening. Better communication, as we talked about, increased productivity, decreased absenteeism. So if people are effectively working together, they're probably going to want to come to work, right? As opposed to just being absent or calling out sick. Um, and as we said, if there's increased job satisfaction, then that may help us with our turnover, decrease our turnover. So, as with anything in life, there's costs to working in teams, and you guys have already experienced this. Here are a few. The meeting time, you gotta figure out where you're gonna meet, when you're gonna meet, it's often a challenge, right? You're also going to naturally think about what else you could be doing while you're meeting. Oh, I could have been at the movies, but I have to meet with my team. Or I could have been at my son's soccer game if I didn't have to meet with my team. So there's some opportunity costs that will come as a result of working with the team, with other people, right? You may lose some of your power. Maybe you're used to being in charge because you're the mom in the family. But when you work with teams, you don't have that same level of power because you have to share it amongst your members team members. So there may be a loss of autonomy. Um, and with that, it's risky. Um, you know, you're talking about my grade and you want me to relinquish my power or some of my power to other people. That's a risk, right? My grade is at risk. Um, and then there's resistance to change, right? This is also a cost to working with teams. Um, so your book describes what we call here is Tuckman's stages of teams and we're going to discuss each stage a little bit. Um, the first one is the forming stage. So this is an initial stage. This is when you first get with your group. This is when you are just getting to know each other. You're just now learning about what the tasks are, who's going to be doing what. It's kind of initial stage. Next stage is storming. And it's just like it sounds. This is a stage where you might have your conflicts. This is where you might ruffle some feathers. This is where um, you may have some resistance from your other team members. So this is kind of the uh, conflicting stage right here, the storming stage. Then you have performing. So after you've gotten through your storm period, hopefully you've made peace and you're able to actually work. So your performing stage is where you get down um, to nitty gritty, you do whatever the work is at hand, um, you have open communication with each other, with each other. you're sharing information, um, you're trying to get to that common goal. And then a journey. This is um, the stage where you pretty much part ways. So you've worked with your group, you've accomplished everything, now you're at a point where you're basically disbanding. Um, so those are the four stages. So, when you guys get in a group, what are some of the questions that you ask when you're assigned to a team? And you can think about your own teams. What are some of the things that you think about, you ask, when you're assigned to a new team? <coughs> strengths, what are your strengths and skills? Okay, so what are your strengths, <laughs> skills, goals? Goals. Mm -hmm. What else? What are the, uh, when you first, you have your first meeting with your group, what are some questions that you ask? Who's going to do what? Who's going to do what? Who's going to do what? All right, so we got to divvy out. Who's going to do what? Um. Somebody say goals. Ding, ding, ding. <laughs> now, we didn't talk about how we're going to measure them. So not only do we want to um, ask what the goals are, we also want to make sure we ask how they be measured. Why is this important? How are you going to know if you reach it, if you don't know how to measure it, right? <coughs> so we want to make sure that we also discuss how we're going to measure the goal. 
No one said deadlines. When you eat with your group, this is very important. Um, otherwise, you're just gonna be wasting time. Um, it's very important to establish or make sure everybody knows when the deadlines. <coughs> um, we also have to figure out where we're gonna meet, when we're gonna meet. To whom do I report? It's probably good to go ahead and establish some type of leader, even if it's uh, everybody. Maybe you decided everybody's gonna work together, or you may decide that you're gonna appoint a team lead. Regardless, it needs to be established. You also need to know what your role is. Um, even if you're not the team leader, as a team member, you still need to know what my job is. What am I here to do? What's my part? How am I gonna contribute to the goal, right? So you need to know what your role is. And along with knowing your role, like I said, you need to know what your responsibilities are. All right, good managers. When we think in terms of team, um, a manager or a leader, you know, you can look at it either way. We don't mind if people ask questions. Now some people may feel defensive if people are asking them questions, but that's what you want. You want people to ask questions. It's the only way you're gonna generate ideas is if people are asking questions. So a good manager is not gonna mind when their team members are asking questions. You also have to realize that um, coaching and mentoring is gonna be part of your role if you are a team leader. So you may say, well, you know, it's not my job to make sure that so-and-so, well, if you're the team lead, it partially is your job um, because it, it's up to you to make sure everybody stays on track to, to make sure we get to that common goal. Um, and good managers want thoughtful observations, right? So all the perspectives shouldn't just be yours. You should also welcome new perspectives from other people, new opinions from other people as well. All right, so if we're choosing a team, putting together our team, what types of things are we gonna look for? What do you think? Think about what you, you know, when you were doing your discussion board, what types of things were you looking for when you were choosing people, putting your team together? What types of things do you want? Reliable person, all right. Definitely need somebody reliable. A positive person. A positive person, that's a good one. You don't want any naysayers, right? What else? You guys are just gonna take anybody on your team? Mm -hmm. You gotta have standards, right? Um, does this person have the knowledge or skills? Do they belong to an area that's affected by whatever our problem is? So if um, our problem is hand washing, do we wanna pull somebody from a county? No. No, right? So we wanna make sure that it's somebody from the area um, where the problem is, right? As I just said, we wanna make sure they have the knowledge and skills to do the task. Um, we wanna make sure they have a clearly defined role on the team, right? Do they have the authority to make decisions and implement recommendations? So <clears throat> even if this person is not our team lead, you still wanna have people on your team that can effectively make decisions. Right? Um, this goes back to what you said. We want somebody reliable that's gonna be able to follow through. We don't wanna have to have somebody necessarily that we have to micromanage every day. We wanna have somebody reliable um, that can also meet deadlines. Now, this one's important. Do we have somebody on our team that's creative enough to think outside of the box? Especially if we're thinking in terms of problems as it relates to healthcare, a lot of times you will have to think outside of the box to come to your solution. So do we have somebody on our team that is capable of doing that? This one goes to what you said. Do we have somebody that can work with people, basically? Um, 
that has a good personality or a good attitude and, and is able to work with all types of disciplines, right? Um, does this team person have the ability to be able to de-escalate de conflict? Or are they a conflict starter? What about this one? What might, how might it help to have somebody on your team that has a sense of humor? What does that add to the team? What do you think? Um, laughter. Laughter. Get rid of the tension. Yeah, get rid of the tension oh, if everybody's sure. uptight yeah. uh, or, or disagreeing. It might help to have someone on your team with a sense of humor. What else might this do? Make it fun instead of like... Yeah, make it fun. If we have somebody on our team that can make us laugh, it's going to feel more like something we enjoy doing as opposed to a task that we have to do. Anything else that you guys can think of? Do you think that a person with a sense of humor might help to build cohesion? If the team has uh, moments that they're laughing and having fun or they have funny moments that they can reflect back on, that would probably help with the cohesion, right? Our, our team cohesion. Um, we probably want to pick someone that has a fairly good reputation in the organization. How does this help us? Yeah. What else? As a team, we might need stuff, right? So might we be able to use this person as a bargaining chip? If we know that they have a good re reputation with this person and this person and this person, we might want them on our team, right? Because we know that we're going to need an extra $10,000 for our budget. So if we know that you know, uh, this person has a, a good rapport with the, the people in finance, might help to have them on our team, right? Um, again, we want to make sure we have somebody that's respectful and values other people's opinions and perceptions. And this one's very important. Um, each individual on your team should be capable of doing this. They should be capable of being able to see the overall goal, and that should supersede their own individual goals. If you have people on your team that are only concerned with, well, as long as I get paid, that's all I care about, it's probably not the right mindset you want to have on your team. You want to make sure that the people are um, looking for the overall organizational goals and making those more of a priority than their individual goals. Anybody have any questions about this? It's important because you may have to put teams together, and so you want to know who to have on your team and who not to have on your team, if you have the option to, to choose. Sometimes you may not have the option to choose. Um, EC, emotional contagion. What this means is it only takes a few seconds, right, to know um, or to formulate a thought, right, or opinion about someone, right? What do they say, like 15 seconds? We meet someone, within 15 seconds, you pretty much know if you like them or not. Um, well, that's the case here. When you're working in teams, it's very easy to catch other people's moves, right? It doesn't take very long. Um, it's very easy to catch on to people's attitudes and personalities. Um, that all falls under EC. Um, it's known um, that women have scored higher on these tests and the scales and are able to read people's emotions fairly quickly. So how does this all play together? Well, obviously, enthusiasm, confidence, optimism, these are all critical to team building and working in teams. Um, so what happens is if you have people on your team that are emotionally aware and can pick up on these things, it can help the team dynamics. It can go either way. Um, it can help the team dynamics positively or negatively. Um, but the take home here is to know that it exists. And again, if you have emotionally aware team members um, working in your group, hopefully they'll be more sensitive to the needs of 
everybody on the team, right? Um, so again, in healthcare, as I said, on a day-to-day -day basis, most of you probably will, will be working in teams, working with each other. Um, and so in, partic in particularly in healthcare, there is definitely a participative work climate. What this means is on any given day, you may have to work with, um, you may work with the same people every day, you may work with different people, um, you may not always get to choose, you may just get put somewhere, um, because things change every day in a hospital or things change every day in the office. Every day is different. And so you never know where you might be put. So you have to be open to working in different types of environments, working with different people, which is the reason I try to mix you guys up. Um, because <clears throat> you have to grow accustomed to working with all different types of people and focus more on what your patients need as opposed to, I don't want to work with this person because X, Y, Z. Um, so there are some researchers that found some key characteristics um, in effective teams. So we're going to go over them. Uh, the first thing they found is that effective teams work with more information. What this means is that effective teams try to get as much information as possible um, when they're working together as opposed to just taking one tidbit of information and stopping there. They also found that effective teams work to have different options. So they work to have multiple alternatives as opposed, again, to just having one solution. They don't just stop there. They look also at alternative options. Effective teams had common goals, so everybody in the team had the same goal that they were working towards. Um, effective teams had humor, so they injected humor into their, their um, teamwork. Effective teams have balanced power structures. What that means is everybody has a certain level of power in these effective teams. And they kept a focus on the facts. This is very important. Um, and we'll talk, when you guys take um, the 200 level management course, we'll get into it more. But you have to keep focus on the facts and not personalities. Um, if I say that your work, and I'm just picking on you because you're in the front, it's nothing personal. If I say that, um, let's say you um, were working on a team together and you submit your portion, it's full of errors grammatical errors, the spell words, etc. If I'm focused on the facts, I would say, you know, this um, submission has a lot of grammatical errors. What I would say is, you're so dumb, read all these misspelled words. Once I call you dumb, I've focused on your personality. It's more personal. It's not factual. Mm -hmm. So when you're working in teams, effective teams will stay focused on the facts, and they don't get personal. Because all that does is create, you know, conflict, um, it wastes time, and you're not being effective anymore. So it's important to focus on the facts, not on the personalities, or don't make it personal. Um, crew resource management. Has anybody ever heard of crew resource management? Um, it's something that's really popular in the airline industry. Oh, so it's, it's okay that you haven't heard of it because it's more popular in the airline industry, but what happened in uh, 2000 was these researchers basically found that this re uh, management style that they use in the airlines could probably be applied to healthcare just because of the fact that it's also very risky, just as risky as flying a plane, um, and we're dealing with lives. Um, so what crew resource management involves is um, working together as a crew or a team to make sure that the job gets done. If you think about in terms of flying on an airplane, think about how um, each um, crew member on that plane has to work together. There's no options. They can't fight, they can't argue. They have to work together to make sure that the plane takes off and lands safely, right? Otherwise, who knows what can happen, right? So it's very risky if they don't work together. And so they applied these, uh, the crew resource management techniques to ensure that they all work together and to make sure that all of the flyers on the plane are safe. Um, and so what started happening in 2000 was 
they started transferring those same, those same management styles into healthcare with hopes that they could have the same results. Um, so, within a team process, um, each person, whether it's the leader or the member, is going to have some how-tos. So we're going to go through the how-tos. If you happen to be the team leader, here's your first one. Ask for ideas. You always want to ask for ideas. You want to make sure everybody has an opportunity to participate. If you're not asking for ideas, people are not going to feel as valuable. So you always want to ask for ideas. Once you open it up for ideas, you want to acknowledge it. So there's a difference between me saying, what's your opinion, and letting you talk, but not really listening to it or doing anything with it. Um, once you ask for ideas, you want to actually acknowledge it, write it down, make sure that person knows that what they said, you know, has been listened to. You don't want to interrupt. Uh, that in itself is just disrespectful. Um, so you don't want to interrupt, and you don't want to allow other people to interrupt either. Um, so what that means is if somebody's talking, somebody tries to interrupt, have them stop and allow the other person to finish. Um, that's your responsibility as a team lead. Now, every team has critics. It's unavoidable. Um, you want to also make sure you ask them for their suggestions as well. Why do we want to do that? Why do we want to include our critics? We know they're going to say something negative, so why do we want to <laughs> ask them? Yeah, we want to hear, uh, again, we want to hear from everybody. So we want to hear what they have to say, too. And, and what else are we doing when we ask the critics for suggestions? They'll never have the opportunity to say, nobody asked me, right? Mm -hmm. So we're giving them that opportunity. We're putting them on the spotlight, right, pretty much, which may be what they want anyway. That could be the reason why they're being a critic, right? Um, so we definitely, absolutely want to make sure we ask our critics suggestions as well and as team leader you have to remain calm if the leader's not calm is the group going to be calm mm -hmm. right it's the team leader's job to maintain control maintain order and remain calm um, if, if you're not calm as a team lead then good luck with trying to make sure your, your team is calm team members team members have a responsibility too they may not have as many, but they have responsibility. Their responsibility or their how-to is to follow through. If you have this to do, it's your responsibility to follow through. It's your responsibility to meet the deadlines, to make sure that your duty or your, your responsibilities are done. So here are some critical elements. After we uh, met, there should be a summary of the meeting, right? So if you guys meet, after you conclude, there should probably be an email that's sent out saying, you know, per our discussion today, this is what we discussed. These are the follow-up plans. Uh, So-and-so is gonna do this, so-and-so is gonna do this. Just a recap, summary. Um, the other critical element, as you guys know by now, is follow-up and follow-through. What's the difference between the two? Because they are different. Follow up and follow through, what's the difference? Follow up is you check and make sure the goals are being completed. Right. And the follow through part of it is, I don't know. <laughs> she has half of it. I had half of it. Follow through is like seeing that they actually went, went through the process and actually Yeah, follow through is actually doing the work. Okay. So following up is like you said, checking in to make sure things are being done, follow through is actually doing it. Um, hitting that deadline or, or hitting the task that you're supposed to hit. So the two are, are different, but both very important. So these are the how-tos for the team leader. Here are the how-tos for the team members. And here are our critical elements. Um, so as I said, you know, every team is gonna have challenges. Every team is probably gonna have conflict at some point. So we gotta figure out a way to handle it, right? Here are some different uh, conflict management options for us. First one is bargaining. Anybody know what this is? 
Give me an example of bargaining. How might we bargain in a group or a team? We could. Putting out the task and say, well, if you two or you take care of this, I'll take care of that. We can bargain and see. Right, so we can bargain our workload. We can say, Rachel, you're, you're great at peer review. So you mind doing my peer review article, I'll do three extra slides to bargain, right? Um, so we bargain. So we have voting. You know, I don't like this black color or this gray color. Let's vote see what color we want our PowerPoint to be, you know? Um, problem solving. This can definitely be um, a way to, to dissolve our conflict, right? Um, now there's different steps you can take to problem solve, and you can do this collectively as a group. Research, maybe we have a disagreement. Well, if we need to find out who's right, maybe we need to research it some more collectively as a group. Everybody look into this, and then we'll see what we come up with. And then we have third party mediation. Maybe we have, um, you know, Ms. Harper just isn't getting along Ms. Barton here. They're just fighting. We don't know what else to do. So your team is gonna contact me, and I'm gonna serve as a third party mediator to try to help you guys resolve this conflict. Um, so all of these are options for you to try to handle the conflicts that you have among your teams. Um, let's see, we're gonna stop there because what I want to get into next won't take a, um, it's gonna take us over time. So if you don't have any questions, we'll stop here for today, and I'll see you guys on Thursday.